welcome to Connie Martinson Talks Books. My guest today is literally the man of books. His name is Gore Vidal. We have talked over the years, uh, his last book, Palimpsest, and now he has written Point-to-Point -point Navigation from his years when he was in the Aleutians. And it's a memoir, 1964 to 2006, published by Doubleday. Welcome, Gore. Lovely to be back, Connie, after a quarter century. Can you believe? I, I think of that line that how it says to you how fast it all went. It does. I guess that's what it was meant to do, to go. But you want to say, hold back the tide. Oh, yeah. Let's replay that last scene. Yeah. But we never get a chance. Interesting book. It is very different from the first part of your autobiography. This is more as in reading it and with the pictures as if you were going through your photographic album and thoughts were coming to you of living moments. Yeah, that's pretty much the way it was done. The thing about memory is that uh, we don't have a tape recorder in our head and it isn't all, you know, like film clips waiting for you to activate the machine so you can see your past. Memory isn't like that, curiously enough. I, I read up on this. Physiologically, what you remember is not some disaster of 30 years earlier. You remember the last time you remembered it. So you're already getting so much distance between you and when you broke your leg at the age of 10. It's already been covered over, that's why I called the first book Palimpsest, which is nothing but one, one memory on top of another, or one piece of writing in a newspaper office on top of another. And that is uh, the way memory works. Once you adjust to it, then you are aware of the tricky things that memory does do to you, and why it is no one agrees with you on what you remember. <laughs> Well, it's sort of the Noel Coward line, too, about music uh, yeah. being, uh, making us all very sentimental in a very cheap way. But this book, too, is a way of recounting a relationship you had with a man named Howard Oster, 53 years. 53 years it was. And he had a hideous death of cancer. And uh, toward the end, it was, you know, it was grim. But I remember, you know, we were going through all the tests, and every now and then you were very encouraged, and then, of course, you, you get discouraged. And indeed, so did he, the victim of it. But suddenly he said, just toward the end, he died right up here in the Hollywood Hills. He said, how old am I? And I said, uh, I counted. I think you're 74. 74? So that's when people die, isn't it? I said, well, you're still alive, I'm still alive. Yeah. Yeah, he said, didn't it go by awfully fast? Yeah, that line just struck me as I read it. The other line you wrote there is about how those hospital, uh, the going through the hospital walls and through the uh, Labyrinths yeah. underneath. Yeah, and the fact that these would become so well known to you more than even your own home phone number. No, you get very uh, used to hospitals. And people would ask, well, why on earth, you know, we were very happy living in Italy. Why on earth do you have a house in Los Angeles, which I've had for 40 years? Not that I lived in it a great deal, I rented it out, but. I said, well, one day the Cedar sinai years are going to come. Yeah. And when they do, I've got to be here. I can't do it out of Rome or out of uh, Ravello. And uh, with him, they came first. And then I am now, uh, I have a titanium knee. Where was that done, the knee? It was Cedar sinai Yeah. And a pretty good job. Naturally, the other leg wants to go, too. I mean, one, once <laughs> one goes, the other one has just got to get into the act. So who knows what I shall do about it? But um, 
it's good to have something like that nearby. That's True. all I can say. And the book begins in 64 when young, gorgeous Gore Vidal had returned and wrote a book called The City and the Pillar. And the New York Times, because it was before its time, couldn't understand, really couldn't understand it, and couldn't understand the art of being able to put on the written page what an experience was really like. Well, the Times has always been the enemy of literature. I sometimes think good government as well, having watched them not do their job during the recent years of the Bush administration. The Times has always been an enemy, not only of me, but of literature in general, truth in general. All the news that's fit to print, I mean, if there was ever an ironic, stupid uh, motto, it was that for them. So I was blacked out after The City and the Pillar, which was 1948. There were eight more books of mine which they would not review in the Daily New York Times. Then finally, when I came back, then I went to theater and Broadway and uh, movies. And at a certain point, I went back to novel writing with Julian. And th their old Daily Reviewer came out of retirement to attack me. This was the number one bestseller in the United I States. I remember. And uh, it was a famous book and still goes on and on and on. And then I realized this is a bad newspaper. First of all, they don't fit the news. They don't print the news that is fit to print. They are grinding axes against people, groups, minorities that they don't like. And they hated just about everybody. Then they decided they hated liberalism. I love this. The, f the right wing is so stupid in the United States that they think the New York Times is a liberal newspaper. Don't ask anybody who works there what they think about it. It's tightly controlled, and it's on the side of big money corporations. And I'm happy to say that their advertising revenues are down lower and lower each year. But in this book, it's a way of looking at America, as I would see it, going lower, each step down where it is the lowest common denominator, where it is a world where people don't read. Well, I can you blame them? Our educational system for the general public, that is people without money, uh, is terrible. I mean, the history books, I monitor them every year, one of the latest American history books. Actually, they're getting rather better now, but it, they've taken a long time to get better. So you have a completely um, uh, propagandized history of the United States. Well, the kids pick this up. They're not stupid. Yeah. They know these stories they're being told are not true. But they are finding information on the Internet. They're that picking is, it up there. I mean, it's still pricey information. It's not in the in-depth that people used to write about or put in books. No, and even the New York Times, when it was still thought it was a serious paper, would occasionally get somebody whom they loathed but to write about stem cell research or whatever just to get something technically correct. But they don't do that. Let me hold up the picture of your study and the fact that there are many blue leather books that were Montaigne and not your own. That is true. That was my study in, uh, in Italy, in Ravello. And that's uh, where I wrote everything from Burr to Lincoln and so forth, right at that desk. And then I had 9,000 books in the house. I now have them all stacked up in my house out here wondering where they're going to find a place to live because it's crowding me out. Isn't it awful to give away books? I, I just won't do it. Yeah, I mean, it's like giving a part of yourself away. How did you find the house in Ravello? Well, there was an advertisement in a newspaper called Il Messaggero, a Roman newspaper. And Howard had emphysema, which was the beginning of the cancer. And of course, never stopped smoking. 
And I thought, we better get out of town where they have decent air, and they had beautiful air down there. Ravello is just opposite the island of Capri, which is mm -hmm. the marvelous winds sweep through that area, and it's good air. A bit like Santa Monica or Catalina here. And uh, we found it, went down, bought it, lived there for 40 years. And then he was struck down. And he had his first operation on, on for cancer of the lung. Just found by accident. He had no symptoms during a general checkup. And after that, uh, all operations are successes out here, as you know. Yeah. Everybody, we got it all. We yeah. got it all. Yeah. Well, it came back in his brain as we were coming out of the pool in Ravello. Wonderful season. Wonderful spring. And he was just walking along and went crashing on his face. And it affected uh, the locomotion side of the brain, which I think is the right. And that's sort of when we knew the end was, was on its way. He, we couldn't fly back in a, in a, with an, in a domestic uh, international jet because uh, the altitude and the uh, you know, pressures inside were so great, his brain would start to boil. It was filled with water. So we had finally to rent a plane to go skipping across the Atlantic Ocean and finally made it from Naples to Burbank. And then it was from then on. As Gerard Manley Hopkins says in that lovely poem, uh, it is the blight man was born for. It is Margaret you mourn for. Yeah. Well, it's the blight man was born for. We must all put up with it. It's in the cards. There is a beautiful chapter for anybody who's lost anyone. Will you talk about grief, Joan Didion? Uh, the fact that you don't heal. Thing, you may go on, but this thing about closure is oh, bull. Absolute nonsense. And in fact, uh, time heals nothing. Time only reminds you what you lost. Yeah. So think of other things generally. On another scale earlier, Arthur Miller and Death of a Salesman, the era in New York where you were all great young lions, Tennessee Williams, Truman Capote, William Styron. I mean, it was the glorious age of literature. Well, it was a good period, I guess. And I don't see much taking our place today, but who knows? Talent is about the same in ratio to the general population at any given time. If there were 10 of us who were any good back then, there'll be 10 people from 10 years from now who will have taken our place. But your stories about Tennessee Williams, whom you called the bird. The glorious bird. Yes. And he talked like this, and he go, yes, I have accepted your, your nickname for me, which I believe is kindly intended. I mean, Tennessee was paranoid beyond belief. He said, good morning, Tennessee. Yes. And why are you attacking me today? <laughs> yeah. Now, you did, we should say recently, you have played the part of Dalton Trumbo in the letters that he wrote to his son. Um, I, I will say that while he was in jail, I used to play tennis, and Cleo Trumbo, who was a lovely woman, would come and play, and you would think, how do you survive with a husband in jail? Well, he turned out, he was not much of a script writer, but he certainly turned out to be one of the great letter writers. Mm -hmm. It was not just to his son, it was to all sorts of people. And he was, uh, he was the old American stock, and by God, he was not going to take anything from, and he was a bit of a racist, and anything from somebody like Parnell Thomas whom he just regarded as this outrageous mick, you know, who was trying to yeah. talk to a trombo yeah. about patriotism. And he was so affronted by these people 
who he thought were uh, appropriating our flag. Well, didn't Thomas end up in jail with Ring Laden? Yes, he did. Yes, That's I mean, it's sort of so like the irony of fate. So there is a God, at least there was then. Now, I'm holding up a picture. This, oh, yes. This is? On the left, there's me in a movie called uh, Fellini Roma. And then on this side, there is Fellini, the director himself. And it's the coldest nights in February in a little square off the Villa de Coronari. And he is reenacting the festival of Noyantri, which is what they hold in Trastevere in August. But we have to pretend, because he's off schedule as always, we have to pretend we're in August, so we're wearing August clothes. We're freezing to death, and he's got a stove yeah. behind him. Yeah. But Gorino, he's, yeah. he's not cold. Yeah. He's noyantri, he's noyantri. I said, it is not noyantri, this is awful. <laughs> he was really quite a, I mean, he was again a genius. Oh, um, great somebody genius. Somebody who, who comes through, and one never can forget the people at the end of his film running across the sand. Oh, and also, he was uh, one of the great liars of all time. I mean, he was not a malicious one. He was a joyous one. And the one question he hated was why. And of course, journalists always made the mistake. And, well, why, Maestro, are you writing about uh, La Dolce Vita in Rome? Why? Because is there is 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 Dolce is uh, Vita. I write about Vita. I, I make film about Vita. And he would, oh, he'd stall them. Then he'd tell such lies about everything. Something in the book, though, is a very, two, two things you say. One is that as a child, when you came back from the boarding school in Arizona, your mother and her husband at that point would not believe that the headmaster was a pederast. And then the fact that for 20 years you did not talk to your mother or speak to her. Well, not because of that. I, but because of Howard. Yeah. Well, I find, well, I, I had realized that the one person I really disliked in my life was my mother. I was not alone in this. This was not an individual judgment. My father felt the same way, and he was the most easygoing man I've ever known. She was, I think a lot of it is, is racial. She was Anglo-Irish, and it is my experience that they are some of the meanest people on earth. They're from Ulster. Mm -hmm. We've had 11 presidents who were from Ulster, mostly like Andrew Jackson. I mean, he was an Indian killer, delighted in killing off people. I mean, he was pretty bad. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the, I remember I was talking to, remember Breslin, the Irish writer? Jimmy Breslin. Jimmy Breslin. And we were talking about the Irish. He's Catholic Irish. I'm Protestant Irish. But he said, um, he said, don't you hate it when in New York they say everybody's got a Jewish mother? <laughs> I said, well, if I, I'm allowed to say so, yes, I do hate it because our mothers are nothing like Jewish mothers <laughs> who bore and smother their children to death. Our mothers mm -hmm. torture us to death. Uh -huh. And the greatest thing they can do, and Breslin agreed, and he said they withdraw their love just at a crucial moment. Yeah. No. And they're not there when you need them. A um, couple of people in this book in our time. Your dear friend, Eleanor Roosevelt. Ah, yes. Well, she was a great influence on me, and uh, I, li I was her neighbor up in the Hudson Valley for the last 10 years of her life. And that house up there was, to me, your Tara, the Scarlet O'Hara Tara. Well, it was a beautiful, beautiful yeah. house. And I, I still dream about it and rather wish I'd held on to it. But uh, it was not to be. But Eleanor was, when I ran for Congress in 1960, she was right there helping every inch of the way. Yeah. And then you ran for the Senate here in California. And I wrote about, yeah, but that was... Totally, uh, by then I was out of New York State. But I do remember they wanted me to run for the Senate in New York against Jack Javits, who was a... a Republican. Well, he was a Republican. Well, he's basically a Democrat who ran as a Republican and got elected all the time. 
And I knew I had no way of beating Jack, and I'd already, I was writing Julian in Rome, and I, I'd gone back to novel writing, which I preferred. And then suddenly it was Alan Cranston, who was quite a good senator from out here. Mm -hmm. And Chris said, you know what you're getting yourself in for? Because at one point it looked like I was winning. And I said, yeah, I think I do. He said, do you know, let's say you're elected now. This is 82. You have a six-year term. But if you want to be reelected six years from now, you must get, somehow or other, $10,000 every week for the remaining weeks of, eight, of six years. Incredible, is that? And that's 82, and now it's, of course, millions of yeah. dollars. Um, and I can't ask people for money, so I, that was the end. I have to show the end papers of this book. Uh, Mrs. Phipps? Mrs. Phipps uh, put this collage together from various newspapers. And there is my old friend, Princess Margaret, up at the top. Down at the bottom, directly below her, is her greatest fan, Sue Mengers, the famed agent. And, she's, and she, she rang me because she said she looked through the book and there was no mention of her in the index. Huh. And I said, well, just, you know, try and read it, you know, you might yeah. find it interesting. Yeah. And then suddenly I get this delirious call, I'm a picture, I'm a picture. And she said one picture is worth a thousand words. So. Oh, that's wonderful. So she's relaxed now. Yeah. Uh, Gore, what are you writing on now? What am I writing on now? Well, I've, for the last nine months, I've been uh, out on the circuit raising money for the Democratic Party of California. Mm -hmm. I've also been working on the campaigns of certain candidates for the House. The House is what I care about and particularly uh, Marcy Vinograd, mm -hmm. who is an extremely progressive Democrat, anti-war, and she'd taken on Jane Harmon in the primary, and Jane Harmon is a pro-Bushite. She's changed enormously since the election, but she was at that time. So I enjoyed uh, campaigning for Marcy and raising money for the party. Tell me about your opinion of the Supreme Court. Well, I was just with an old classmate of mine from St. Albans, the prep school I went to in Washington, Episcopal, and uh, he's called E. Barrett Prettyman, and he was assistant attorney general to Bobby Kennedy, and he should have been a judge by now, but the Republicans have blocked mm -hmm. anyone like him. He's considered the greatest constitutional lawyer in Washington, D.C. He's uh, argued over 90 cases before the Supreme Court. And every now and then I get a report from him when I can't stand what I'm reading in the papers. I ring him up, and, and I've just come from Washington, so I actually saw him. And he was commenting on the, the Scalia, Thomas, et cetera, court, and particularly the recent Chief Justice, what's he called, gone out of my head. And uh, he said, and he's been arguing before the court for many, many years, and he's lived through, and he was, I don't know, aide to one of the justices, as well as being assistant attorney general. And he said, I've never met so many vicious people. These are mean. They, they take joy in harming others. and. Uh, mm -hmm. I said, well, uh, let, let's forget the personal aspect of it. Uh, what do they have against the Constitution? I think my answer historically was better than his. He's still a constitutional lawyer, and he can't make a case against the Supreme Court unless he's arguing before them, in which he's perfectly capable of saying what he thinks. Yeah. But his just general impression over the years of court watching They've, just, they've lost all idea of the, uh, the separation of powers in the federal government. They don't seem to care. And the Republicans have been sending every candidate for a judgeship is worse than the one before. These are people who don't know any law. And yet you in this book do, in a way, castigate Bobby Kennedy 
during that period when he was Attorney General, and that this may have been the cause of why the Mafia, if they were the cause, assassinated Jack Kennedy. Yes, they were, and it was all due to Bobby trying to better his image, which was very low with the American people. All the American people knew about, I'm talking now about 62, 63, as Jack is getting ready to run for his second term in 64, and Bobby was going to be campaign manager, but there was a little talk that Bobby might take Lyndon Johnson's place. Yeah, her. They'd have a Kennedy, Kennedy ticket. Thank God they didn't try for that. But he was, uh, he thought he needed to build himself up in public relations because all he was known as the guy who went after Hoffa. Yeah. Well, that was a good thing to do, but you've got to have something else going for you. So he made a lot of arrests of mafiosi up in Appalachia, where all the leaders of the mafia around the country had come together to pick the new head of the New York mafia. Yeah. And he arrested a lot of people. And that was the result, the end result. Gore, thank you so very much. Will you autograph my book? It is a treasure of a book to read. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. If you'd like a copy of our newsletter, Good Books, send me a stamped, self-addressed envelope to Good Books, P.O. Box 69, 1640, Los Angeles, California, 90069. Look for a column in the Beverly Hills Courier, us on the web at www. ConnieMartinson.com, streamed every day at 9, 3, and 11.30 at night, and support your local library, because whatever you can do, libraries are our finest democratic institution in America. Anyone can go in today and get a library card and learn how to read or read better. We'll see you next time. Gore, thank you.